So um, our class, we're talking, this is ResPres 101. We're talking about, this is like the introductory, introdu this is like kind of like our new members class, really, kind of help everybody orient themselves to um, what ResPres is and what ResPres is like. Brian started out by giving dis distinctives of what, what, what are the most important differences in a Reformed church in the broader evangelical world of churches and than the even broader world of churches that we live in. And for the, for the, starting last week, we started talking about, about res pres and what, what makes, what, what, uh, what are our distinctives as a, as a local church. Um, you know, and so last week we talked about how all, all Reformed churches that are faithful, we all have the same theology. We all sign off on the same summary of doctrine called the Westminster Confession of Faith or if you're in a, a Dutch tradition, you'd sign off on the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgic Confession, the, and the, the uh, Canons of Dort, other, other confessions from the time of the Reformation. We all sign off on the same theology except for churches. Our churches look very different, not, not just across time, but in different areas and different parts of the country. The way that churches actually look and the, the emphasis of what we do can look very different depending on the time and place and people that God has placed us in to minister to. And so last week we talked a lot about our central core um, philosophy of ministry, which is we are endeavoring to practice a beautiful orthodoxy. It's not enough just to be orthodox. You, that orthodoxy uh, is it's not enough just to be orthodox and think about orthodoxy and argue about orthodoxy and write books about orthodoxy that orthodoxy is meant, the purpose of it, is to change our hearts and to transform us to look more like Jesus. And when the world sees that, uh, there, there's, there's power in it to make God known, which is, our, which is the business, our Father's business, which we are to be about. And so, um, the next three weeks we're gonna talk about the three things that we do or the three, the, the three ways we do the basic things that all churches are supposed to do in a way that brings out that idea of beautiful orthodoxy. If you read the New Testament, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. There's three things that church is supposed to do. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to worship God, we're supposed to make disciples, and we're supposed to be on, engaged in mission. We're supposed to be reaching new people and bringing them in to make disciples. Every, Every New Testament church should be focused on those three main categories. And so our, we call those the three circles. There's this book called Simple Church that was really influential that helped us to kind of think about how do we keep the church streamlined? How do we get not caught up in doing a bunch of stuff we shouldn't do, get bogged down in secondary items that are good but not great? And this, this book uh, called Simple Church, it just talked about a concept of three circles where you have mission, discipleship, or, or worship, discipleship, mission. And everything you do has to be justified by fitting in one of those circles and, in, and increasing your ability as a church to, to do those things, right? Uh, <clears throat> which is helpful because it's, it's really easy to get sidelined, right? Just look at your week last week. <laughs> or maybe I should just talk to myself. Like, look at my week last week, right? Um, so here's our three circles. This is the way we explain it. First, we practice. A, we are uh, we are practicing a holistic worship. Uh, second, we are it, that's our worship circle. Second circle is our discipleship circle, which we describe as becoming who we are in Christ, because that's really what discipleship's all about. We're not learning how to be somebody we're not. We already are indwelled by the Spirit. We already are a Christian, and we already are, we are already in union with Christ, and so discipleship is really the process of learning who we've already become in Jesus and then walking that out. Um, and the third circle is we're creating a culture of mission, <clears throat> uh, which means essentially we are, we're training everybody in our church to be vocational missionaries, which we, what I mean by that is that every one of you God has placed in a certain area in, in the world, in the middle of a network of friends and family workers and co-workers, some who know Jesus and a lot who don't, and that's on purpose. He's placed you there to be a light in that specific network of people to love them and serve them and open up opportunities for the gospel to be shared, for people to ask 
what do you believe, you know? And why do you believe it? Uh, and so we're trying to create a culture of mission so that every one of us, every member of Res Pres, is a little, a little point of light of God's kingdom out in the broader community that is the entry point for people to begin, for God to bring his people in to his church through us. So those are like a, the three main things we do. And so today we're going to talk about circle one, creating a, a holistic worship. What does that even mean? Um, well, let me start by saying this. Worship, worship is, we tend to think about, uh, because we're good rationalists, right? Because I'm a good rationalist. I was raised to be, we're all, we were all born and trained from birth to be good operating rationalists. And so we really, what we think is that the way to, to grow or the way to do anything is to first you think about it and then you do it. First you think about it, then you believe it, then, then you do it. But actually the Bible says something completely different. The Bible says that we are essentially uh, emotional creatures who, who love things and have desires, and the way to, 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 uh, the way to believe is actually backwards. Listen, listen to what, listen to Romans 8, 5. Here's kind of the control verse for that. Uh, Paul says this after, uh, Paul says this. I'm not going to get into all the background for this. Let's try to be, let's try to end on time today, shall we? <laughs> for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now, I've read that verse, not kidding, for 17 years. And I've thought, oh, got it. If I set my mind on the things of the flesh, then I'll live according to the flesh. But if I set my mind on the things of the Spirit, then I'll live according to the Spirit. Sound reasonable? That's because you're all rationalists. But that's not what it says. Listen to what it says. Those who live according to the flesh result, have their minds set on the flesh, is really what he means. And those who live according to the Spirit result set their minds on the things of the spirit and isn't it like mind-blowing 17 years i read that verse and thought well we think our way we think our way into into action but really what paul is saying is a fundamental principle that we act our way into belief we act our way into into what we love we practice those things whatever it is that we're practicing in life whatever habits and rituals uh, and things that you do in everyday life, uh, not only does that betray what you really value the most, but it actually is forming your heart to value those things more. And so that's where worship comes in. Worship is, it's a practice. It's a rhythm of life, and it's, a, and it's an actual practice and a ritual and a ceremony, that, a high art ceremony that God has given us so that we live into the things of the spirit which then sets our minds on the things of the spirit which then sets our hearts and our desires on the things of the spirit and then before you know it we are you know we we love god's kingdom and his righteousness first and then everything else works out and so what we do shapes our hearts and shapes what we love and that's why worship is so important it's not just something we check off on Sunday morning. It's not just a box that we check off or an addition or something we do to show our reverence for God. It's actually something that God has given us to help us to live in the spirit, to shape our hearts and our minds and our desires to love God more, which is like the number one thing we need in the world. In the midst of the minefields and the destruction and every satanic trap that's out to catch us, uh, the one thing that helps us more than all other things is to love God over and above the traps <laughs> and the destruction of the world. And that's what God is trying to work in us. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Why? That's why worship is so important. And so uh, uh, the, kind of the model that I've been going, going to use through the rest of this class is to kind of outline what a, you know, what a beautiful heresy might look like. If we're trying to practice a beautiful orthodoxy in all of these things, Let's kind of make, put, set some foils up. And first we'll look at what, is a, what does a beautiful heresy look like? 
then we'll look at what does an ugly orthodoxy look like, and then we'll hit the middle, or from those things we'll learn what does it look like to practice a beautiful orthodoxy in our theology of worship and in our practice of worship. So let's start with uh, number one, the making of a beautiful heresy, and I'm calling this spiritual Walmarts. Um, <clears throat> so if you guys, uh, this is a great book by Ross Duthot called, uh, um, <laughs> oh, I can't remember the name of the book now. <sighs> Bad Religion. Yeah, he named it after the band. <laughs> Bad Religion. How could I forget that? And um, the introduction of the book, he gives this like concise history of post-World War II, all the way through 1965, like all the churches in the West were like expanding rapidly. I mean, there's just some, something like, like global, you know, like the threat of global nuclear war and like coming out of a global conflict, you know, with whatever 300 million people dead. Uh, there's something about that that might turn your minds to God, right? And, and that's what it did. From 45 all the way through 1965, there was this rapid expansion in the church. Everybody was on doing building projects. Churches were going up. Uh, that Westminster Tower went up during that time. This church was one of the biggest churches in the country, 5,000 people in attendance every Sunday. There was a Marine color guard that would turn the pages for the organist. Marine color guards in full dress blues would like walk all the admirals down to the front row at the beginning of the service, right? It was culturally big, not just Christian big. And during that time, there was this rapid expansion. And then for some reason, we're not going to get into all of it. In 1965, when everybody thought it was just going to keep going forever, it just stopped. And all of a sudden, there was these half, halfway done building projects that weren't funded. And people were, you know, the churches started shrinking. And uh, stuff started shutting down so that this church at one point was 5,000 people. And now it's 300. Uh, and that's the, in the mainline churches, especially that's the trajectory, right? And so there was a bunch of missiologists. Missiologists are guys who study mission. In, uh, <clears throat> particularly out of one, sem one seminary called Fuller Seminary, and they got together and started to think about what is it, how can we turn this around? How can we like fix what's going on? And so with, you know, with good intention of their heart, what they thought was, well, this stuff, the way we do Christian worship, we, you know, we've been doing it like this for 2,000 years almost. It's just out of touch with what everybody's into now. So what we need to do is we need to retool Christian worship altogether and refocus the whole thing on not just be, not being a time when God comes and down and meets his people and strengthens them through means of grace and assures them that his covenant's still in place no matter what you did last week. We got to stop doing that because it's too weird. People don't get it. Instead, what we need to do is focus our worship services completely on reaching the lost. And so our worship services eventually, essentially became permanent tent evangelism, to tent revival sites. Uh, and so we changed our worship spaces. Instead of having worship spaces that were vertically focused, to focus on the vertical relation between God and man, they became, uh, looked like, like the regular rock venues and shopping malls that everybody's used to because that was more comfortable. Uh, and instead of um, talking about you know, the deep need of how we're going to overcome and conquer sin and death and hell and how to live in the power of the spirit. In the meantime, it became about, they decided what we really need to do is figure out what are the everyday struggles of people out in the world? What are they really facing? How are they hurting? What are their needs? And then all we have to do is figure out how Christianity answers those needs and then add a little water and boom, presto, insta-Christian. And it seemed to work. And church is blowing up to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. However, there's an author named James K.A. Smith from, as a philosopher, a Christian philosopher from uh, Calvin Christian and uh, Calvin Christian College. He has this, he talks, his, he has this whole book of, uh, discussing what he calls cultural liturgies, cultural liturgies, meaning that um, it, it's not just that the Christian church has like a liturgical rhythm of life with a, with a gospel and with a, with a hope at the end, 
uh, you know, with a means of salvation and then a, and a, and a you know, and an eschaton, a hope for the end times. There's all kinds of liturgies in the world. Um, and he uses like a shopping mall as an example, right? He, talk, he makes this theoretical situation where Martian anthropologists come down and study human behavior in the late 20th, first 21st century. And he, and he, and he determines that the Martians would have believed that the, the shopping mall was a temple. It had its own call to worship. It had its own gospel where you could like, it had its own like confession of sin where all your, you know, all your insecurities and the things that you feel are wrong about you or your pear-shaped body or whatever it is that's bothering you, keeping you up at night, your pot belly, you can go to the mall and, and worship and gain access to things that will then make you feel better and help you to present yourself in the various masks that we carefully cultivate to show one another, to make ourselves feel safe. And so there's a sense of safety, a sense of belonging, and then there's the eschaton hope that you will be accepted and loved. Uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, he talks about how these, cult, these liturgies, these habits, and these practices are all formative. If that's what you practice, if those are your habits, if that's your ritual, those rituals will form your heart to desire and love those things more and more as you go along. And so what happened, unfortunately and terribly, was that as we turned sanctuaries into malls and movie theaters and music arts into entertainment and the message of Christ into a message of therapy, the result is we created spiritual Walmarts that perfectly form the heart to love and worship the dysfunctional, narcissistic, consumerist worldview of the world around us. And that's where a lot of Christianity is at right now. I call them spiritual Walmarts because Walmarts are, what are Walmarts? So these massive stores that buy in bulk and cut prices down and draw in customers from all the little mom and pop stores, right? They don't really create any new business. They just siphon off all the business from all the smaller local owned stores to themselves as this giant conglomerate and take all the money without really offering the same level of individualized service. My, my dad used to own a small pharmacy in Encinitas and that was his, you know, he was able to offer like real individualized service and care for everyone that came in that shop. But you go to Walmart, you know, that's not there. And that's, that's what's essentially happened to the Christian churches. That's what the mega churches are. They're not, they didn't really create a bunch of new Christians as much as they just siphoned off all the Christians from the smaller churches where they had pastoral care into the great megapolis of the spiritual Walmart. And so that's, yeah, that is the worship practice of the spiritual Walmart. It actually forms you into something. It forms us into what we do and what we, what we worship. So if our worship is all about me, what I can get, how I can feel better, how I can do this, how I can accomplish this, how I can achieve more in life, how I can trust God to become more successful in my career and my relationships and my finances, it's a worship service and a liturgy that creates and reinforces that dysfunctional, narcissistic, consumerist worldview. And that's bad, <laughs> right? Okay. So now let's talk about the making of an ugly orthodoxy. And I'm calling this culturally solidified worship. And by solidified, I want you to think about like uh, pouring concrete. You ever, I used to have the privilege, really, of being one of the guys on a concrete hose crew when I was first getting sober. I was like the only white boy on the whole crew. And, and man, that was such a great experience, man. It was a great experience to be out there, to, to do that and work that hard and at the end of the day, anyways, you pour the concrete, right? What happens? It comes out wet and then it slowly hardens and solidifies and becomes hard and immovable. That's what the picture I want you to think. My mind is becoming solidified. Hold on. Um, there's a famous image of a barge or a like a line of barge, uh, barges in the late 19th century headed up the Congo River, and on that barge was a full Western European pipe organ <laughs> that they were bringing to this church 
upstream in the middle of inland Africa. And along with the picture is the picture of like the pastor with his starch collar. And then there's a ton of like African Christians around them and they're all like, they're all dressed like Queen Victoria. They're all wearing like long dresses and you know, and it's got to, you know, I don't know how hot, maybe, you know, I don't know how hot, hot it was, but the point is there's this picture of, it's a, it's this, it's this stunning image of Western Europeans who are, are focused at least as much and maybe not more in, in evangelizing Africa with Western, Christi with Western European culture more than just the gospel. In their minds, those things were just inseparable. If you were gonna plant a church and create a Christian culture in another country, I mean, you, you, I mean, think about how hard it would have been to get a full pipe organ up the Congo River in 1879. But in their minds, that was, I was like, you know, you have to, because this is part of Christianity. Uh, and it's a perfect example of how a, 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 an expression of Christian worship that's faithful to the Bible, that was an expression of Western European culture, which is good and beautiful, right? I mean, some of that worship is some of the most beautiful that we've ever produced. But it's an example of how that particular expression a cultural expression of biblical worship became so solidified, became so hardened in their minds that people were then unable to distinguish it. Be the, the cultural elements from the biblical elements, they be just became one conglomerated concrete block and so everywhere they went they had to bring a pipe organ. Um, And so, there's nothing wrong, obviously, there's nothing wrong with the beauty of Western European worship. Where it gets weird, where it, gets where it starts turning into an ugly orthodoxy is when the, the people who practice that begin to believe that it's the only permissible cultural expression of Christianity and then start to enforce that on other people or bring it to other people, you know. Side note. Uh, over the course of history, there, there was another guy named Hudson Taylor who went to inland China. He was the first guy to start dressing as the Chinese dressed and began living as a, a Chinese person in China. Uh, and he brought the same Orthodox gospel, the same Orthodox worship service, but he had Chinese elements surrounding it or such style. And his mission was su wildly successful and a lot of those missions where they just tried to turn people into Western Europeans were not. Um, but here's the, here's the ironic the ironic fact, the ironic fact is this, that every cultural expression of Christian worship is also culturally conditioned by the time and place it was developed, right? You just can't, you just can't get away from that. It's not that, it's not the case that uh, through 2,000 years of trial and error, the, 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 the Scots of the 19th century Finally, we're able to, I'm sorry, I, I always pick on the Scots for any, any Scots in here. I'm part Scottish too, but our, our church like, comes from the Scottish Presbyterian tradition, so it's, it's, it's helpful. It's not that the Scottish finally perfected like a biblical worship in all of its style and circumstance. It's that when they perfected this beautiful style of worship that was totally appropriate for 19th century Scotland, it was culturally conditioned by... 19th century Scotland, which at the time was what? It was a very austere culture. It was very grave. You all seen, uh, you know, Willie, the old Believe It or Presbyterian from The Simpsons, you know? <laughs> it's a great character, right? It's kind of like that, just super strict, super austere. Um, and those cultural influences like kind of came into the church at that time and became solidified in the minds of a lot of people that that is the only way to do Christian worship. Uh, and the control verse for that is, let us worship God with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. <laughs> and that's a real verse in the Bible, right? That's true. However, um, in the New Testament, the command to rejoice in worship is given 49 times to, to that one verse. One verse, reverence and awe, 49 times to exult 
to rejoice. That's got to mean something, right? Um, and so add, and then add to that, add to that this. Well, our, one of our professors, one, the president of our seminary, Robert Godfrey, said this. The great sin of the Reformed Church is to turn the sanctuary into a classroom and the sermon into a lecture. You kind of add to that austere philosophy of ministry, that grave, serious reverence uh, that, that, you know, that permeates the entire worship service from beginning to end. You add to that this idea that, you know, the idea that orthodoxy is really just about intellectual learning. And so our worship service is really, uh, a, you know, the worship sanctuary becomes a classroom and the, and the sermon itself becomes just a lecture in theology without ever getting to any points of application or transformation in Christ. You add all that together and the result is that you have these 21st century churches using the reverence and awe verse as a proof text to enforce not a biblical worship but a cultural expression of biblical worship. Um, that's, that's very different from the time and place that we live in now. There's a... Um, Yeah, let's skip that. <clears throat> so where does that leave us? Um, on the one hand, we have like expressions of worship that are completely separate from the Bible and 100% culturally conditioned for today, right now. And on the other hand, we have, on the other side, we have these expressions of worship that are heavily rooted in the Bible, but they're also just as rooted uh, in a foreign culture hundreds of years separated from us. So what do we do? How do we, in the middle of that, how do we go about practicing a beautiful orthodoxy? And we call this practicing a, a holistic worship, which is really, you know, a, a way of saying what Jesus said to worship, we, you know, worship in spirit and in truth. Um, and so first, let's look at the orthodox part. The orthodox part of Christian worship uh, is, is, is historic Christian liturgy. There's, there's a purpose. We're, the way we do our liturgy and the way the things that are in it, uh, they're not things that we have like pragmatically you know, thought out necessarily. They, they are, it's the result of 2,000 years of you know, however many generations that is of Christian people like searching the text and finding out what it is that, that's pleasing to God in worship. What does God say about worship in the Bible? And then, t and then shaping our worship to that, forming our worship based around what the Bible says. Uh, we're not the first ones to do this, right? There's been generations of men and women who just as full of the spirit as we are have been working this stuff out. And we get to, we, and we can benefit from that, right? Our, if you look in our worship guide every week, in the introduction, like the first paragraph says that our goal is to create a Christian worship experience that celebrates all of the beautiful contributions of our own generation without discarding the theological wealth of our past. And that's to say that we live in a specific time and place and there are beautiful things that we're contributing <clears throat> and to worship, however, there's two millennia of historical and theological wealth that we can tap into and that we're tied into as a people, right? <clears throat> and so really, for the, you know, for Orthodox Christian worship is this. The purpose of Orthodox Christian wor worship is not primarily an evangelistic mission to unbelievers. It's primarily a meeting place between God and his people where God is coming to us. He has promised that on Sunday, on the first day of the week, we see that Jesus, if you're, anybody asks you, why do you worship on Sunday, the Sabbath, the Saturday? The reason is Jesus. Jesus set the pattern for worship on Sunday by doing worship on Sunday, <laughs> right? And then for the rest of the Acts, we see the apostles, whenever they get together and they're worshiping, it's on a Sunday. So that's where that comes from. But we get together on the Lord's Day. And God promises to come and meet with us, and it's, a, it's, it's essentially a covenant renewal ceremony. Like in the Old Testament, who, who can tell me how long did the first covenant last? If you know this question, don't answer. How long did the first covenant last? Anybody want to take a guess? Hmm? No. 
Maybe you're going to say, well, let's see. A lot of people go, well, okay, uh, first covenant. Let's say Mosaic covenant. How long did the Mosaic covenant last? I mean, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Given to uh, Moses around 1400 BC and abrogated at the cross, uh, 1400 years. 15 minutes. Really Maybe. Started. Maybe 30, right? What happens? Moses goes up, he gets the tablets. As soon as he cuts, all the people are like, Moses, we don't even know who that is. And they make, they make the golden calves. And they say, we know what they say to the golden calves. Aaron says, oh, Israel, here are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. Here is Elohim who brought you out of Egypt. And so they're taking Egyptian cultural forms of worship and still calling it the worship of Yahweh. That's what, like, how worship gets corrupted. They're using their own ideals and their cultural forms to create a worship, to worship Yahweh, but it's a corrupted worship that is really conditioning them to be Egyptian, not God's people. And, uh, and, uh, and then they have a big party, right? <laughs> party, read the text. And, uh, and the tablets are smashed, right? 15 minutes, maybe 30. And then the rest, of the, new, the rest of the Old Testament is God renews the covenant, Israel breaks the covenant. God renews the covenant, Israel breaks the covenant. God renews the covenant, Israel breaks the covenant. Over and over and over and over and over again. Our covenant can't be broken. And so every Sunday, really what our worship service is about, it's essentially a covenant renewal ceremony where God comes and invites us to come and worship him as his people through his word. When the word of God is preached or read aloud in a Christian worship service, the Holy Spirit occupies that word. uh, And we call it the sacramental word, meaning that the Holy Spirit occupies that word and it becomes the living word of God for us. And he speaks to us, calls us into and invites us into his presence as his children to worship him. Uh, And then what happens? We confess our sins together and then he assures us of of our pardon. He's letting us know that you have not broken the covenant. You cannot break the covenant. How does he let us know that? We read the gospel passage and then he assures us that our sins are forgiven. We're still in the family. We still belong to him. Uh, we hear that, you know, and then we hear the sermon. We re- respond with a transformed life. We hear the Lord's Supper. Uh, uh, you know, there's all these elements that are part of really the Christian story from beginning to end. So we're not basing our worship service based on the story of, you know, the American dream, or we're not basing Christian worship based on the hope of 20th century therapy. We're basing our worship service based on the hope of God in redemptive history where God comes to his people, calls them out of sin and death, forgives them of their sin, initiates covenant, reassures covenant, uh, washes them and transforms them, them by his word. They enter into faithful covenant relation. We're in covenant relationship with him. We're dining at his table. And at the end, we go out where he gives us blessing upon us, letting us know that we're going out as the dwelling place of God to be about God's business. That's the purpose of our life. And so what does our worship service do? It doesn't reinforce narcissistic American culture. What does it do? The, those practices, those rhythms, those rituals, it reinforces and the, the forms themselves, by practicing them and living in them, it begins to shape our hearts to love and desire the thing with which we're worshiping even more. To worship creates in our heart love for God. And the more we love God, the less you're going to love death. Straight up. And y'all love death. I love death. It's, it sucks. But that's a fact. If I leave myself on my own, if I don't come to church, if I stop immersing myself in that, or I give God the Heisman, I just magically, I'll start loving death more and more until I start thinking that death is good and the things of death are fun and fulfilling. And even though at the same time I'm becoming more and more miserable in my mind, I just, I, you can't put the two together. Like, well, this is causing this. <clears throat> but the act of worship, the act of worship, it forms us and transforms our hearts uh, into desiring and loving something else, which is God. Uh, 
So the purpose is to meet God. The things we do in worship are, are, uh, are dictated by the New Testament. I used to have a pastor who would say, there's nowhere in the New Testament that says anything about how we're supposed to do worship. And so they would have low riders on stage and you know, they, would, they would do all kind of stuff on Sunday morning. They would, you know, um, but that's not true. It says there's, there's several key verses that says ex- exactly what the apostles did, like Acts 2.42, that we would, they would, you know, fellowship, they would, they would, there would be apostolic teaching, there would be the prayers. It's not prayer in, in that text, in that verse, it's the prayers. There were f- prayers that they would say together as a community. They would break bread, they would do the Lord's Supper, they would sing and encourage each other with hymns and songs and spiritual songs. Um, and so we can see from that that there's specific forms of worship that, is, that are pleasing to God that he accepts, that we are called to do. The reading of scripture, the preaching of the word, prayers, prayer, um, um, the confession of, our confession of faith, confession of sins, the absolution of sins, uh, you know, the Lord's Supper, baptism. There's these things that are uh, you know, laid out for us in scripture. And the, the alternate of that is because of the way our minds work, it's just not safe or good for us to start making up our own ideas of worship on, on the side. Why? Golden calf. Those people thought, they, they were, you know, they really thought they were worshiping Yahweh, but they weren't. They were worshiping a cultural liturgy that was leading them to be worshiping frogs or the, or the you know, the current equivalent. Uh, and we call that the regulative principle of worship. God has given us the forms with which we should worship him by, and we're not allowed to go outside of those forms. However, those elements, those forms, are, we're allowed to do those in a way that's culturally legible to the people that we're ministering to, right? Those forms aren't solidified in a, in a cultural expression from 12th century Syria or, uh, you know, or... 19th century Scotland, we have to do those forms, preaching, reading the word, prayers, singing. We have to do those forms, but we can do them in a way that makes sense for our culture and our people. So when you see our liturgy, when you come into Res Press, what do we do? We have, we have a very high liturgy. And it, like, people get confused because we have a high liturgy, but it doesn't, often f- it doesn't always feel like that. Because they're not coming in and it's not some guy just, you know, walking up saying, Hear now the reading of God's word, you miserable worm. <laughs> the demeanor is not stiff. The demeanor is like, it's like you would expect when you're, you know, for this time and place. And we do worship songs that aren't, we do the great hymns that have s- survived the centuries, but we also do worship music from our own time and place that's, that's theologically sound, that's emotionally appropriate, that's singable, everybody can sing. Uh, and there's another one. Do you remember? There's four, four qualities of our songs. Uh, we have four like categories our songs have to meet. They have to be theologically sound. Um, <clears throat> they have to be emotionally appropriate for the place in the liturgy service. They have to be safe to sing. And they have to be oh, us, uh, aesthetically beautiful. They have to be beautiful. We don't take a song just because the lyrics are bomb, but the melody is just so bizarre that no one for the last 300 years knows it, what's going on, which happens all the time, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> so the styles is part of the beauty. The style is we do things that make sense for our community and for the people that we're trying to reach. However, we do it in the forms that are dictated by the Bible. So we are sold out for the Reformed Orthodox forms of worship that our forefathers have discerned from the Bible, but we do it like we're 21st century San Diegans, because that's the people we're trying to reach. Um, <clears throat> worship is, a, is, a, is another principle of worship called the dialogical principle of worship, which means that worship is a conversation between God and his people, right? We kind of hit on this already. God comes down to meet his people, but then we have a, we're having a conversation with him. It's not, we're, we're not just an audience watching a show. When God comes down, he calls us to worship and we respond with his word. 
to both praise and adoration of him. And then we respond again with a song praising him in reverence and awe. That beginning song usually focuses on coming in. We call it a song of approach. We come into God's presence as his creatures who he's called in. We come in with a sense of reverence and awe of who we are coming before, but, you know, not without a sense of joy. <clears throat> and then there's the reading of the law. And our response to that is we honestly confess our sins to God. And then there's a reading of the gospel where God assures us that we still belong to him and we respond with the doxology. We sing the doxology of praise to God for the gospel that he's given us. And then knowing that our relationship with God, the vertical relationship with God is unbroken and we are in fellowship with him, that means we're still connected to Jesus and connected with one another. So we greet one another with the peace of Christ. It goes horizontal. We greet one another as the same members of the body. <clears throat> and then God teaches us out of his word. We respond with a transformed life. And we have the Lord's Supper, where God invites us to his table. And we have a foretaste of our heavenly reality. And we respond with praise. And at the end, there's the, docs, uh, the, uh, the benediction, where God promises to go out with us. And we go, or we respond by going out into the light to be witnesses uh, to the Father. And, and so the beauty in it is great art, let me close with this, great art is a combination of, of form and freedom, right? <clears throat> if you've ever like, if you know anything about like some of you lived through the late 60s, if you ever wondered why like all of a sudden in like the late 60s, it just looked like the full moon came out and, and everybody turned into a werewolf and people were wearing mismatching patterns and stripes and plaids and polyester nightmares. And, and there was, there was, what was happening was there was the philosophical atmosphere of the world was kind of being overtaken with existentialism, which meant you could do whatever the heck you want. And it filtered down to music, it filtered down to clothing. And so clothing lost any sense of form and it had all freedom. And that's why your grandparents look like the way they do. And <clears throat> great art has form and it has freedom. The form creates stability, it connects us with the created world. It keeps us tethered to the reality of God. And then within that form, there's freedom to create and make it beautiful, right? Think about fine men's clothing. It's a very rigorous art form. Suit, you know, maybe a waistcoat, tie, pocket square, shirt, button-up shirt, slacks, <clears throat> shoes. Uh, within that rigorous form, though, you can create a lot of freedom and beauty uh, in fashion, right? And that is what, that's truly beautiful. Same thing with worship. Same thing with our worship of God. There's forms that God has given us that keep us tethered to reality, that keep us tethered to God, and those forms are what God has decided in his wisdom. It's what is going to form our hearts to love him more. But within that form, we have freedom to do it in a way that's beautiful, to add, to add our creativity to it, and to do, to do songs in a specific way, to pray in a specific way, to have a certain demeanor when we are interacting, when God's ordained servant is speaking to God's people in the authority of God and God's people respond, we can do that in a way that's beautiful for us, that makes sense to us. Uh, and so that's really what we mean by holistic Worship. Holistic worship means that worship is not just an intellectual exercise where we're coming to learn things about God. It means that we are engaged in the whole bodied worship of God. Not just our minds, but our hearts and our bodies. Exult. You know what exult means? Exult means an emotional expression that involves body, mind, and spirit. It's literally, it's a form of rejoicing that causes your body to move. <clears throat> now we have, we have big trouble with that. One reason is because there's been like all sorts of abuses of <clears throat> charismatism in the church, um, but also our you know predominantly Western white culture is just super uncomfortable with expressions of emotion. So it's hard for us to do it. <clears throat> but not ancient Israel, not King David, walking in front of the ark, dancing like a fool with an ephod on. I went to a Lebanese wedding once. That was the most amazing thing. It gave me an insight into what God is talking about by a wedding ceremony, right? We say, 
you know, the, wor the worship service, especially culminating in the Lord's table, is, is, the, is the worship supper or the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we think bride and groom trying to like shove some cake in each other's face, right? And everything's like, <laughs> no. Middle Eastern worship or wedding services are buck wild. It's like drums, it's just like a hip hop concert with acoustic instruments. It was just all just dancing and drums, it's joy. It was like overflowing with so much joy. That is biblical worship. That's what God is calling us to grow into, not just our minds, but our hearts and our bodies as well. And let me tell you, <clears throat> here's the great irony. I'll close with this. The great and terrible irony of the whole seeker-sensitive movement of trying to make Christian worship service uh, an evangelistic tent crusade and make it focus on on, on evangelizing people. The terrible irony is that there is nothing more evangelistic than an unbeliever walking into a Christian worship service and seeing God's people engaging with the living God. The rejoicing, the vi I remember the first time I walked into a Christian church, I was like, there's, it's a doxological evangelism. It's a, the praise of God itself, uh, and the comfort of God towards his people and the presence, the thick, viable presence of the Holy Spirit in that room uh, is the most evangelistic thing an unbeliever can possibly see. And so that's our goal, to create that kind of worship, that res pres. Awning. So when are we going to pass out? What? Out of... Uh, Control crazy wedding ceremony. Can we what? <laughs> I want a wedding ceremony. <clears throat> okay, great. <laughs> yes. Linda, we need to hire you as a consultant. <clears throat> Any other questions? We got like one, or one, maybe time for one. We should go because it's. Let's go worship. Hey, how about that? Lord, we thank you for. Um, we thank you for a vision of of a beautiful Orthodox worship. And we pray you would help us live it out, Lord. Help us to have the courage to live it out. And we pray that your spirit would press us <laughs> and not let us get out of it. <laughs> because we honestly, Lord, we love death. We would love to just sit there and be, you know, in our corner. But you're calling us to a communal, holistic worship where we worship God with our whole being. Uh, and we pray that you would help us achieve that here. And we pray that it would be evangelistic, that you would then send people to witness it, the people that you are calling to become part of your family and help us to wrap them up and love them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.